Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charles Clancy, and I am the Senior Vice President and General Manager of MITRE Labs. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone to our Grand Challenges Power Hour. Um, for those that have attended in the past, um, thank you for, uh, for, for, for joining us again. Uh, this is a monthly series of talks where we explore um, really key challenges in uh, emerging technology and, and innovation more broadly. Um, over the last few months, we've covered a range of very specific topics from AI to cyber to healthcare. Um, and this month, we wanted to do something a little bit different and, and look more broadly at um, how research and development, science, technology, and innovation um, are potentially changing as we go into sort of this new epic of, uh, of federal investment in research and development. Uh, so today we have a, a keynote um, from Secretary Ash Carter sharing his thoughts on on really uh, American competitiveness and, and economic and national security. Uh, and then we have a, a panel of experts who will uh, dive deeper into some of these topics. Uh, so once again, thank you for joining. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ash Carter. Um, Ash is the, of course, the 25th uh, US Secretary of Defense. Um, he currently serves as the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and also serves as a, um, um, a, a MITRE Distinguished Visiting Fellow. Uh, and it's uh, our, our pleasure and honor to have him with us this afternoon. And so uh, uh, to kick it off, um, I'd be very interested in your thoughts on this topic area in general, and then we can dive into uh, to Q&A. Uh, and a note for the audience, uh, please feel free to, to begin populating the Q&A section, and we'll, we'll work those into the conversation uh, as we progress. Terrific. Well, good to see you as always, colleagues at MITRE. Uh, as always, and good to see you out everywhere in the audience out there. Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, as we were talking before this, we thought we would open up the aperture somewhat from individual technologies to a theme that um, I think is the answer to a question I'm frequently asked. And the question is, how do you compete with a communist dictatorship? What's America's side of that story? Now, you didn't used to have to explain that because the China was way behind. Communism was on the ropes, uh, particularly in the 90s. And it looks like our system was triumphant. And it, uh, of course, uh, it's it's it, our answer in, um, in in terms of political life is freedom and democracy, but that's not really the answer in technological uh, life. That's in a different domain. So, what is the answer to a country that can deploy in a statist manner? the integrated tools of military, economic, and political pressure in a way that societies like ours cannot do by design to pick off an American company here and there, an American ally here and there, and overwhelm them uh, with their power and requirements to operate it under a set of rules that are not the ones that we run the economy and the technology based on. So that's the question of the era, I think. And I'd like to address that uh, today. It is for DOD and us in the national security community also the uh, answer to uh, the question, uh, the issue of agility. I mentioned China, but in actual fact, the uh, China is a, the most important of, but not the only one of a package of threats, potential threats, uh, that are uh, challenging to technology in a way that our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which I worked hard on uh, in three different jobs in the Department of Defense, 
you couldn't do otherwise. We had people fighting a war, they were at risk and they had to win. And so it can't be otherwise. They had to be a big priority for us. And if you ask, well, does that mean, to some extent it took the Pentagon's leadership and resources away from uh, the future and uh, yes, uh, it, it did. Um, that era is ending now for reasons both good and bad. And more and more people are realizing what uh, I at least realized a long time ago, and I think many of you on this audience who do this all the time realized, which it but was very late to realization by most of the country, uh, which is that that China wasn't going to turn out to be what we'd hoped in the eighties. It just wasn't. Uh, it was. It was going to be China. It was going to do things its own way, and rather than converge on our way, it was going to do things uh, its way, and. If that, that is now apparent, not unfortunately to everybody, but almost every, everybody. Uh, something the wars did help us with, I think, was the concept of agility because war requires agility. And so we did do things at a fairly low end in the CT and coin fights uh, that prodded us to go fast. And I was a part of that as well. The, the Juon system, for those who know inside ball, but the Joint Urgent Operational Needs Statement, that's just one bureaucratic acronym, for a method of going faster than the usual program of record and you know, all the milestones and all that stuff, um, and getting something in the field that was imperfect but necessary and good enough, or as good as could be in a short period of time. So whatever you thought of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and, and uh, uh, so forth, uh, which I thought was were necessary, um, but at any rate, we were in, uh, whatever you thought of them, uh, we got out of all the effort and, uh, and of course, loss uh, in it, we did get some sense of agility. And the way I used to put it when I was acquisition executive was uh, for, the, for the wars, we need to ask ourselves today what we will regret not having done tomorrow if uh, we could have and we didn't and somebody loses their life or uh, fails to provide, prevail. Uh, and we got in the habit of doing that in the war pretty well, or at least satisfactorily in all, in all the services and all the branches. The question today with the Chinas of the world is what will we wish we had done today, tomorrow, if we have a dust up with China? We need to have that constant urgency of not what are we going to do in 10 years? I mean, I have 10 years and we can't afford to lose in a dust up with China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. We just can't afford uh, to lose. How would, you, how would you contrast sort of the need to both uh, be prepared for a, a kinetic engagement with China with the sort of reality day-to-day -day of, of, I guess, what I would call hot competition with China uh, that's really more economic in nature. How, how does the DOD think about, about both of those okay. simultaneous so let, let me Let me get to that because that, that's the basic point of what I want to say. Um, the, so what is our secret sauce? Here is our secret sauce as I see it. Uh, which is the answer to the China problem, both here at home and when we're, if we're asked by friends and allies, how do we know you're going to be okay and the Chinese aren't going to just trample all over the place? Uh, 
and, and, and it's good that I'm talking at MITRE about this because I think our secret sauce has always been, and this is the answer to us, your cyber urgency uh, implication is the bridges between the public sector and the private sector. That's where we're strong. We don't try to do things either way exclusively. And the MITRE Corporation is an example of this. Uh, you see the Endless Frontier Act being dis de debated in Congress. Those who don't know where that phrase comes from, it comes from a book written by a guy at MIT, which, which was answering the question then, which was, how do we keep this innovation going now that World War II is over for the good of the country? And they said, well, your government's got to stay in the game. That's the key. But the government can't do everything any more than it did during the war. The government went to private industry, the Ford Motor Company and other companies and said, do it. The Soviets didn't do it that way. And, and you know, we, we did better in the long run. So our way has been to go to the private sector. And the key there are in between organizations. That's what Nat the National Science Foundation, the NIH, where the government gave money to the private sector, in particular to organizations that resided between the public and the private sector. That got another burst after Sputnik when um, uh, NASA, NRO, DARPA, which is an in-between organization, and the MITRE Corporation, other FFRDCs in UARC, which are in-between organizations to bridge academia or industry in the private sector with government, on the other hand, uh, and private par par public partnerships of all kinds. That's our secret sauce. Um, when I was Secretary of Defense, I tried to build more of those, and I think we can do more. And some of them have been replicated and copied and certainly improved upon the Defense Innovation Unit, the Defense Digital Service, the um, uh, Defense Innovation Board, and, uh, and things like the Strategic Capabilities Office, which, which were designed to link industry, especially really agile industry, with us. So that is the key, and that's uh, why I think uh, organizations like MITRE are important because they create a different kind of atmosphere, which is in between a purely scientific institution on the outside and a government scientific institution on the inside. And building those bridges and maintaining those bridges is what we do uniquely well. And uh, by 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 pushing the, the two together rather than building bridges between them in an independent way. Um, I think we're gonna do better than China if we follow that, if we keep following that road. So that's our secret sauce, I think, and we need more of it. Um, interesting. So one of the, uh, you mentioned, of course, the post-World War II era, really investing in, in nuclear deterrence. And you mentioned uh, sort of the investment in, in technologies and the, and the space race, right? Those kind of coincide with the, with the first and second offset strategies that uh, we executed as, as part of our, our national investment strategy. Um, uh, so when, when you were Secretary of Defense, we were uh, really the third offset strategy was was one of the big parts of uh, of the overall plan for DOD. Um, I wonder if you could reflect on the third offset strategy and, and, and how it rolls into some of the large investments that we're talking about here in order to maintain pace with China and emerging technology. Yeah, I mean, and it, that, that, uh, in addition to the bridges, which I talked about, that's the mechanism we need resources. Uh, no question about it. And that's what we meant when we used the term third offset. Uh, uh, actually, it was uh, Bob Work who thought of the term, uh, which I think was great and I adopted also, but just to give authorship to the right place. Bob's a bit of a military historian. And so he thought of this idea of third, calling what we're doing a third offset. And I, I like that. Um, and so I used it uh, as well. Uh, and I think it's been more widely adopted now. But it has uh, a, a purely money side where we do need to invest more, uh, both in technology itself and in early adoption and driving down the 
uh, learning curve for for new technologies. Uh, we've done that in the past. Uh, semiconductors is a great example of that, where initially we were the only ones able to afford it, but we were willing to afford it because um, we had a need that, that you know a toaster didn't have, uh, and that was an ICBM, and, and so we were we were in the space program. So we were willing to pay for something. And then once the government made the investment in that, it could come down the learning curve. So, so the way we invest in technology is, is money for sure. Uh, and, and these mechanisms I've been talking about, but also early adoption. And that has been historically, I think, uh, the principal way in which so-called spinoff has occurred. So when we're talking about money, um, large numbers are being thrown around, right? So the Biden campaign proposed a $300 billion investment in R&D uh, as part of, of their platform. Uh, the infrastructure uh, proposal from the White House uh, has uh, closer to a half a trillion dollars in R&D. And so depending on kind of which numbers you look at and over what period of time, we're talking about anywhere from a, a 40 to a 70% increase in the federal R&D budget. And how, how do we wrap our heads around spending like that? And, and how do we focus that investment in the most productive way for the most durable gains for our economy and national security? Well, I'm, I'm all for it. If you think about the, if you put it in perspective, particularly to how much we're spending overall now, number one, and believe we can afford to spend and what we spend in the defense budget. Um, these are large sums, but not unaffordable sums. And they are the sweet spot of what we need to do. And there's also some really, really superb people there and coming in. If Eric Lander, for example, the science advisor, uh, we're going to get a new undersecretary, both for, uh, acquisition sustainment and uh, uh, R&E and great service secretaries. And we've got both of Secretary of Defense and Deputy Secretary of Defense and Lloyd Austin and Kath Hicks who really know what they're doing. So it, this is not uh, the amateur hour. These days are really, really good um, people. But I think you're right. It's not the amount of money that matters. It's how we spend it. And you know, we just can't throw it I don't think in the in the in the old way and expect to get anything more than the old end product. And that's why these vehicles that importantly link us to the commercial tech sector simply because it moves fast and it is um, it is larger than us. Uh, we didn't used to be that way. I, I want to grow. But reality is we're not going to get that big, but we are going to occupy a niche that it doesn't, particularly in early stage uh, work. And uh, that is a national necessity as well as a necessity uh, for defense. So I, these are large sums of money, uh, but they're good. And actually, if you go back in history, um, we've been losing ground a little bit in pure dollar terms for a while. So some of this makeup. Yeah, no, it's certainly the, the federal R&D spending as a function of GDP has, has gone down uh, pretty dramatically over the last 50 years. And we've seen industry uh, pick up the gap, which, of course, is uh, why uh, a lot of the in-between organizations that can effectively connect with the industry uh, R&D investments are so important. Um, but uh, I guess another question I, I, I would have is as you think about what it means for DOD to be investing in a particular technology area. Um, right now, there's very much a sort of acquisition mindset. We're investing in R&D because it's going to lead to a capability that's going to address a mission need. Um, but I wonder, is there a, a um, when we think about dual use, is it more than just uh, opportunistic value to the commercial sector? How do we think about DOD investing in things that really have a, a commercial first kind of opportunity uh, with a goal of, of, of economic impact? Well, that's a really good question. That's a tricky one for any Secretary of Defense because, um, you know, it's not our money and I'm supposed to be the Secretary of Defense. So I need a strong defense rationale. However, I don't think I need an exclusively defense rationale. 
and I never behaved that way. And I think most of my other Secretary of Defense behave that way either. We are also a part and a big part of the national technological ecosystem. And we're supposed to contribute to our, our, our part. So let me give you an example. In a given field of technology that is dual use, I use energy technologies just as one, but doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, you know, we invested in energy technology where we had a need that was distinctive to us. Fine. We, had, we invested where we were cost insensitive relative to the commercial sector and therefore couldn't wait for the commercial sector to advance the technology. We needed to hasten it and pay for it and they would eventually benefit from it. Then there's the third category, I think this is the one you get to, which is tricky, which is I also believe that we had a role in the national technology effort. So if the president or the science advisor or the national security or homeland security advisor had an architecture that was a national one rather than a purely defense one, that was a good thing. And if that meant I had to play a certain part in that orchestra, that also I thought was a role that I could defend to the committees uh, of, of defense um, as, as much as a purely uh, defense programmatic uh, role. So uh, there are three ways we, 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 we contribute and interact with the larger uh, what one is on the way to a defense program per se, but there are others. Right. Um, a few uh, attendees and have raised a similar question really around um, sort of China's approach to industrial policy versus uh, the sort of uh, squishy in-between language we're using on the, on the discussion today. Um, how, how can we ensure that, that well, will we ever be as, as economically efficient in our R&D investments as a, an industrial policy-based approach? And if not, um, what do we need to do to make sure that uh, we're, we're at least keeping pace with that, uh, China? Uh, okay, yeah, you said squishy. I think the best of both. Uh, I think, I think ha having a robust private sector, which does have independence, economic and indep technological independence, is a good thing um, and it makes it stronger in the end than trying to control everything. Um, and so I, I think it's the best of, of, of both approach. Um, you know, it, and, and China's actually, I think this is related to what you're asking, is, is hurting itself, I think, in the following sense. Uh, with Xi Jinping, as opposed to Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin, and I've known them all, um, the way he runs things now, the other, the other, the China, as it exploded starting in the 90s, really, was a technocracy. That is, they were wrestling with a problem. They, they would say, what's the best way to solve this? Now they ask, what does Xi Jinping think? That's different. So I, I think, uh, well, for, we have no alternative, but I don't think it's squishy. I think it is a best of both worlds where you enjoy the strengths of independence and the private sector, and you enjoy the strengths of state leverage. Uh, and you have best of both. I think you try to put them together, it's you're, ultimately you head down the Soviet role, road. Interesting. No, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, another sort of broad set of activities and some of the uh, Q&A uh, from the audience reflects this is uh, really China's um, increased 
a power projection in uh, things like standards bodies, right? Uh, you can almost uh, look at their approach to certain international standards organizations as, as building their own A2AD bubble almost uh, in order to dominate the, the space and really control the, the direction of, of those international organizations. Um, so much in the way that we sought to, to poke China's A2AD bubble kinetically, um, how, do we, how do we think about that economically? Uh, here's, here's one thing that's really key. Uh, and that is having everybody else on side. Remember, China is big, uh, but it's half of Asia. China is big, but it's one fifth of the world. And so having the other half of Asia and the other four fifths of the world, broadly speaking, going our way, or not the Chinese way, that is the most important ingredient, why, which is why it's important to have these relationships and not deprecate them and to uh, not go one-on-one -on -one with China, which is their favorite way of doing things, uh, bilaterally, um, even for us, but to go multilaterally um, because others are objecting to the same thing. I guess the other thing I'd say to what you, you're, you're saying is, there's no nice way to say this, that the, the Chinese, uh, let's see, at, at root, if you uh, look at American approach to international life, uh, we don't, you know, maybe you don't always do this, but I think most of the time we do it. It makes me so proud of to be part of the American government is um, w that we're infused with the, the culture of a, the enlightenment, right? the dignity of man. Uh, I guess we'd say men and women now, but the point is it was universal. And, you know, of course we've been America first in lots of ways, not always be important. And so, but at least we were, but we didn't have right there in front of you the fact that it was all about us. China is really all about China. Uh, it doesn't so far have a, it, its um, uh, its story about itself is all Chinese. You can listen to a speech with Xi Jinping, and it's 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 all about us. Even where we do things internationally, it's all about us. Um, so that can be a successful strategy if, if the not us doesn't rally. And I think we are the principal rallying point uh, for that. So the, the, the things we need with China are first, a good offensive and a good defensive game plan. Defense is stuff like CFIUS. Offense is what you're talking about, which is getting better at AI, getting better at biotech, getting and so forth. Uh, but the other is uh, not going alone, but having others uh, with us. That adds a lot of weight into our side of the balance. And that's true geo geographically. It's true geologically, I mean, geologically, geopolitically. It is true uh, economically, technologically, everything else. Okay. Um, another question that's come up uh, from a few uh, folks in the audience is around uh, what what is the threshold where uh, this I guess what I what I would call hot competition uh, leads to actual conflict? Right? How do we know how close we are to the edge? When we talk about things like semiconductors, Taiwan becomes a, a key asset in, in the conversation. Um, and and as, as we're making these large investments, how do we how do we stay on the on the competition side of the competition conflict boundary? Um, I. Uh believe that the Chinese respond to pushback. And that the best way to not get in a position where they are overreaching is constant pushback. They do respond to it. Uh, and I think I, my own view is we haven't done enough of that in a long time. That's been true in the cyber area. It's been true in the maritime area. Um, and 
and and so forth. And I think they do respond. So one one thing is you there's a, a theory that some people have, which I don't subscribe to, which is let's not cause trouble. Don't push. That'll just that could spark a crisis. That's a mistake. In the long run, that's exactly what leads to a crisis. And you're right, probably the single one that really is, they could become so wound up to that they do it without realizing that we are going to respond. And that's Taiwan. Uh, that that bothers me because I've been talking to the Chinese for 25 years about Taiwan, and you know they always they all, uh, the standard rap since Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon went there was, look, we're not going to argue about your civil war and whether you're the real government of China and so forth. So that's what we give you. What you give us is don't rush this thing. Just let it lie. Uh, and that was the Chinese would you know, pretty much say, yeah, we can't go out and say that to our people. But, you know, we're not, we're not going down there. Xi Jinping is, is really suggesting now, and this is new, and this is new compared to Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin, let alone people going back to Deng, um, that there's a, a, a clock running here. That's a problem. And I think that, uh, you know, nobody wants this, but things that people don't want to happen in history all the time. And uh, I think that the, the, the constant, steady, firm pushback is as important as having allies and strengthening our, offense, our own offense and defense. Right. Um... You mentioned cyber, uh, and uh, another question that's come up a few times is really around um, uh, cyber defense and, and protection of our own intellectual property. If, if we're about to embark on a, a massive investment in S and T, uh, how do we keep that from not just getting stolen right out from under us and essentially it accruing to the Chinese economy rather than the U.S. economy? Uh, well, yeah, you got to stop them from stealing it. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, companies have a big motivation themselves to protect their own information from one another. And that can be a problem, actually, when it comes to things like um, uh, uh, common standards or open systems and, and so forth. So there's a lot of protection that goes on that we don't have to do as a matter of national security. But when it comes to theft and espionage and rule violating, stealing of uh, of intellectual property. I think companies expect their governments to protect them and that that we ought, we ought to we ought to do that. I, I think that is not meddling. I object to this uh, the uh, suggestion sometimes that we're not competent to do that. that we don't have the, the insight to do that. and that's why, organizations like MITRE and these other in-betweeners are so important uh, because they infuse the government. And one of the ways the government gets infused with insight and, the, and access to talent, uh, which, which we need. Um, so, you know, you can't go back, you know, the, I guess the real, you ask, you ask a great question, all these are great questions. The, um, the, the crux of that whole thing is to is that I think think this is doable, but the reason why it's different doable from let's say the export control system of the Cold War. I, my very first job, advice and consent job, was an assistant secretary of defense. One of my responsibilities was for export control. So I learned more than I ever recommend a human being learn. Uh, about export controls. But uh, at any rate, it, that was Cold War stuff. And the, 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 the thing was that like China today, the Soviet Union then was a geopolitical uh, 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 fundamental competitor. 
The difference was we didn't trade with them. We put a plastic bag around them so that nothing could come in and nothing could go out. China, we're trying to trade with while we, while, while we have a Cold War with them. Uh, that is unique and why we need this new playbook. And it's definitely got to have intellectual property uh, and protecting our own companies as part of it. So that, you know, there is a defensive play there. And I want to emphasize it's different from the Cold War. But there are people who kind of say, oh, don't start doing that because you're just trying to recreate the Cold War, which, which, which was fundamentally different. And my answer to that is, yes, it was. Therefore, we need a different approach. But that doesn't mean protecting American IP. Um, uh, uh, and there's a whole personnel side to this, by the way, which is really touchy um, because people come here, people go back, um, people are recruited. Um, and that's that's a long conversation, but a really a really important on acquisition too, and buying and doing more. And I was just talking to somebody earlier today. Um, I won't say whom, but a company that said they have pretty cool technology and um, are patriotic minded, bless them, and they they don't want to take Chinese money because they know what happens, which is they suck the technology out and then drop you. And you know, we've seen that too much. But we, we have to not only protect them, we have to give them alternatives so that they can get capital here on the, on the basis of our values and not have to take Chinese money because Chinese money comes Chinese control don't make any mistake. Right, right. Um, another dimension of this is really uh, sort of the U.S. education system and making sure we've got a good human capital supply chain. Uh, when you talk about supply chain, uh, human capital supply chains, uh, perhaps uh, paramount among all. Um, are there things that we need to be changing in our educational system and and, and as you project that forward, how do you think about uh, either people entering military service or government service and ensuring that they're bringing sort of the right skill sets with them? That's a, that's a great question also, man, you're really hitting all the, the key things here. But uh, so, so people, um, uh, other than technology or next to technology, people are the biggest managerial requirement, certainly the Secretary of Defense. And so I spent a lot of time on that. And now uh, what I have devoted myself to, since I can't run the Defense Department any, anymore, so what do you do? I wanna make a contribution. My contribution is to the next generation. And that's why I have affiliation with Harvard and MIT and, 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 and training. And one of the things that we need to wrestle with is, but, but is really changing to positively now, is what's called the military civil divide or the unfamiliarity of people with military service or public service. Um, now, that was really bad a while ago, particularly after Snowden and everything. And I was, um, you go to a company about veterans hiring for just as an example of that. It's a recruiting thing. It's a retention thing. It's tech talent. It is why these in-betweens are so important. They are a conveyor belt for talent and technical insight. And you need that. Um, but I, you know, I, I would get a CEO who would say, make a pledge. So many thousand veterans they were going to hire like they're doing me a favor. And I always said, you, you don't realize it, but I'm doing you a favor. We're doing you a favor. These are fantastic uh, people. And in that way, the whole climate's changed. I'm sure you see this, right? I mean, we see it in the MITRE environment uh, all the time, which is the disinclination that was around in the tech sector to work with the government. They didn't think it was cool enough, it was fast enough, or it was wrong. All misapprehensions. Um, that, fortunately, that 
that wheel is turning, but it's been a generational wheel. Uh, the digital revolution took place in an environment which was, um, let's see, very libertarian in its outlook. Didn't think it owed anything to public, you know, the public space. Didn't owe anything, wasn't going to give anything back. Um, and of course, nobody's self-made in this world. Uh, and, and the government is the way that we band together to do things have to be that have to be done. So you got to value that. Now you can complain about it, you can, can criticize it, you, but oh, best of all, you got to join it or contribute to it. Uh, and that spirit's coming back. Um, and you see it in recruiting. We've seen it in recruiting for quite a while, um, but you've seen it in the tech sector now where I, I, I'll bet, aren't you seeing it? Isn't it easier to recruit people? uh now that it used to be i mean you know uh, the money still matters and so forth of course but mission mission is pretty important to human you know happiness yeah 100 percent. yeah the uh, certainly a perspective from miter when it comes to recruiting is, is mission is one of the key selling points as it is with with federal service and military service um but uh, at, at, at some point, there's a salary disparity that's hard to keep pace with. And uh, I know the, 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 the tech sector is paying very well for... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think over well, the last... One, one point about that is you got to resign yourself. You're not going to have these people forever. And that's why a mixed career of some sort to make that possible is so important. So you're going to have a force now and forever that... Uh, mixes people who are our people, that is the ODs people, for a long time, civilian and uh, military, with people who come and go. And that's why something like the MITRE Corporation or the Defense Digital Service and these things that serve as ways to for people to try out making a public contribution. And then sometimes they yo-yo back and forth. Um, and, uh, but they don't want to sell ads their whole life. They want to do something uh, uh, bigger than that. But if you make it indentured servitude and say the only way to do it is to do it for life. Now, what you can't laterally hire is majors and colonels and generals. Um, but you can laterally hire a lot of other things if you work, uh, if you work at it, best of all, attract them when they're starting out or create vehicles where they can come in and, and, uh, and come out. Um, so you need the personnel pipeline to make this whole tech, um, secret sauce work. One last question. Uh, how has, has the COVID-19 pandemic affected all of this, right? Everything from our view on investment in biotech to uh, our views on intellectual property around vaccines to now vaccine diplomacy. I guess, what's your perspective on on that whole thing? I, I, there are parts that are are tactical and temporary, but there there are parts that are they're lasting. Um, a lasting one, I think, uh, is uh, awareness of health and public health. I don't think people are ever going to get into a confined space with other people any longer without having it in the back of their mind that they're getting, they're getting Lord knows what from all the people around. That's not going to make them stop congregating. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's a difference. And I think if you're in a person facing business, uh, now, we don't have a problem in the military because, you know, we have so much power over our people and they're generally compliant and so on. But if you're serving the public, um, you got to be aware of how they may have changed their behavior. Scientifically, um, I was saying the other day, I was doing something with Kara Swisher, Swisher the tech uh, journalist. And I was saying that this was the year of mRNA. Now, why do I pick that? But because 
it, most people don't really know what it means, but they've heard, they've never heard of it, but they've heard of Moderna, which is mRNA. Um, and this is a category of bioscience, biotechnology, which is in between, everybody knows genetics is important. Right? We know how to do now informational genetics and we have know how to sequence things and all that stuff and turn them into digital strings. We know how to do that. And then over here is where the action is, which is enzymes and proteins. But in between, in here, that's a really important spot for defense and for therapeutics and so forth. And that's where mRNA resides. And I think for the first time, I think people are realizing what a powerful, powerful thing that is to, to master. And it's the, it's the key to the best kind of uh, vaccines we have. What may, many people don't know is we had something to do with creating the technology of mRNA, especially vaccines. That is we, DOD, and specifically DARPA, I remember when I was undersecretary and review all the DARPA programs and so forth, we had something that, that was doing that. Um, and the rationale was that we were sending kids to Afghanistan with 14 shots in their arm or something. And we were looking for something that would be more universal or agilely adaptable and so forth. And that, you know, that is kind of what the MRA turned out. Uh, to be. Now, COVID-19, I guess to get back to your original question, is a son of a gun, but it's, boy, it's not as bad as it could be. It's as bad as we have always feared, which is something that is flu-like in its spread, but more lethal. And that's exactly what it is. And all of us have been saying, uh, you know, and you and your colleagues, when, when, when MITRE first started its biotech division, that was one of the things we, we, we would say. Um, is is the thing to worry about is something that's flu-like but lethal, and COVID comes close. However, COVID has this characteristic of it has to do with its coding that makes it really miraculously subject to vaccine protection. I mean, we're so lucky, you know. Trying to go back last year, and you and I were having this conversation. Would you ever have thought that by now, by now, we would have deployed, at least in some countries, including our own, uh, a vaccine that was 90% effective? You know, in no person, you know, that you could possibly bet on that. And that's happened in that sense. It's really kind. And that, that characteristic that makes that possible actually applies to a family of viruses. So that's good news. But one of the ways you get at it is with the mRNA. So that's that's one that in the purely tag can't go into all you know biotech and so forth. And there are people watching you know more about it than I do. But if you had to pluck a single subset of biotech that this year has made more top of mind to people, I think it's what lies in between the genome on the one hand and, and expression on the other. The other thing in there is called epigenetics, which is really, really important also. It doesn't matter if you have a gene or not, if it's not expressed. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for uh, your informative remarks. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was great to have you with us. And um, <laughs> thank you for your service and, uh, and, and bringing your insights to us today. Well, thank you. Thanks for what MITRE does and everybody. I don't know who's out there on the line, but um, um, I'm sure many old friends are, are out there and I appreciate your interest in the subject. Great. All right. So up next, I am handing uh, the mic over to Dwayne Blackburn. Uh, Dwayne is the senior principal for S&T Policy uh, here at MITRE and serves as deputy director for our Center for Data-Driven Policy. Uh, so, Dwayne, over to you to kick us off with the panel. Well, thank you, Charles, and uh, thank you and Ash for your comments. That was uh, very enlightening uh, and actually a great launching point for our next panel, which will dive into many of these issues in a lot more detail and from varying expert perspectives. 
I plan to e ask each of our panelists a complex question that will enable them to speak for a few minutes, but then we'll focus on the questions that you and the audience pose in the Q&A section. So please continue to fill up that queue. But first, we're going to start by giving each of our panelists 60 seconds to introduce themselves. Let's have uh, Teresa go first. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm the uh, Teresa Mayer. I'm the Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships at Purdue University. Um, I uh, came back to Purdue in 2019 and um, am responsible for overseeing our $700 million research enterprise, where uh, relevant to this conversation, about two thirds of the work that we do is STEM related. Uh, we focus on holistic cross-sector cross partnerships that span the federal state agencies, as well as industry and foundation. And um, I'll be talking a little bit about the work that I did when I was serving on the US President Council of Advisors on Science and Technology over the last couple of years uh, in, in this panel. So once again, thanks for the invitation. Great, thank you, Teresa. Look forward to chatting with you. Dave. Yeah, Duane, uh, thank you for the invitation and i um, pleased to be here this afternoon. Um, my academic background goes back to quantum physics. I used to joke about that being my wasted youth working in the commercial technology sector, but of course today with the importance of quantum computing, it's, it's good to be back and to be relevant once again. Um, I started in IBM in the research division in 1988. I've had jobs all over the corporation, software uh, services, and, and probably one of the most interesting roles I held for uh, several years was the chief technology officer for IBM Federal. I worked with our federal clients both before and after that and continue actively working with them uh, today in my role as chief innovation officer for IBM. And so I think uh, it's great to convene this group and talk about such a critical problem. And it was a treat to listen to Dr. Carter's perspective on all this. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is my old uh, NSTC partner in arms, uh, Tara. Hello, thank you for the invitation today. I'm Tara O'Toole, I'm an executive vice president at InQtel, <clears throat> which is a non-governmental, non-profit organization that acts as one of those in-between organizations Secretary Carter was talking about. Um, <clears throat> we were created by CIA 20 years ago to connect the agency with the kind of innovative technology that was then coming out of small startups and still is, um, who are not um, necessarily eager or prepared to deal with the federal government. Um, and I've spent the last six years um, working on biotech investments, particularly those um, which would be useful in fighting pandemics. And for the 10 years before that, I was in academia <clears throat> as a professor of medicine and public health um, running what is now the Hopkins Center for Health Security. And before that, I was at DOE dealing mostly with nuclear matters and uh, as an assistant secretary. And prior to that, I was a member of the late, great and much lamented Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Great, thank you for joining us. And last but, last but not least, uh, Rob. Yeah, thank you, Duane. So uh, Rob Atkinson, I'm the president and founder of a think tank in Washington called the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. I started my career at NIST and then had the pleasure of working with Tara and Secretary Carter at OTA and had the distinction or dubious distinction of actually have publishing the very last report. I was the only person in the office that day to be damned if I was not going to have that report be mailed and I stuffed 200 envelopes and mailed the darn thing. Um, anyway, at, at ITIF, we focus on a wide variety of innovation and tech policy questions. My own particular focus has really been on China and industrial policy. I, I, I use that word proudly. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, we need an advanced industry policy in this country to make sure that we can compete in advanced technology industries. And that's uh, been a lot of the work that I've been focused on. All right. Thank you. And thanks again for each of you for joining the panel. I'm I mean, thanks uh, everyone, let's get started, I'm excited. Uh, so much of the community's attention on this front has historically focused on agency budgets and looking at government-wide R&D funding levels as a percentage of GDP. 
Uh, but as uh, we talked about a little in the last uh, session, we can't just throw money at, at R&D and expect everything that we need to magically come out in the end. Uh, so Tara, uh, you previously mentioned uh, managed DHS s and uh, which has to both develop and transition uh, science and technology into operations, and now have a somewhat similar transition issues at InQtel. Uh, so from a technology agnostic standpoint, what do you feel are the most important non-R&D aspects of science and technology that the nation, and specifically the federal government, needs to better focus upon? Well, for starters, I think we need to embrace a much broader concept of what constitutes national security and national power. And the technologies and science needed to protect the country and allow it to prosper. Um, as Secretary Carter was saying, it's not just about direct military strength. We have immense and pressing problems that we have to address. And we have to figure out <clears throat> how we can put together some kind of technology strategy and who and how will um, set priorities and um, make sure we get what we need. Um, <clears throat> we're in a very different situation than we were um, after World War II um, in that uh, there are many more technologies the private sector, as well as the government, is much bigger and much dispersed. You can't just go today to a DuPont or an Eastman Kodak <clears throat> um, or a General Electric, the big corporations that built us the nuclear weapons complex. Uh, some of the most innovative technology, like mRNA, is going to come out of tiny companies you've never heard of and cannot easily find. So in addition to a much broader and well thought out technology strategy, the second thing I would say is that we need to create new forms of interaction between the federal government and the private sector. I think um, as Secretary Carter said, that is our secret sauce. I think the interaction between government and the private sector is critical. I think our bridges are rickety, however, I think a lot of the private sector has no idea what the government wants done or what is in the national security interest necessarily and doesn't know how to connect with the federal government. And I think a lot of um, the uh, islands of innovation out there have no bridge to the federal government, don't know how to connect publicly. Um, I think one of the ways of fixing um, this problem um, is to create some really big, ambitious, audacious projects that require the government and the private sector to come together and do something, build something. Um, <clears throat> I also think that thirdly, we have a big problem with our talent resources inside and outside the federal government when it comes to S&T. Um, there's always amazing, fantastic people in the civil service. But <clears throat> my recent experience is that the technically fluent cadre of people in federal service is very limited and very discouraged. Uh, we have, um, and this is not just a matter for the R&D or the S&T agencies. Um, all of the agencies need significantly more analytical talent not to mention significant IT upgrades to do their jobs. DHS, for example, is essentially a big data collection and analysis operation, um, but it's very difficult to hire computer scientists in the federal government right now because they have so many opportunities. Um, so we need a plan, probably a decade long plan uh, to recruit and retain more people who are technically literate. This includes senior officials. Um, I totally agree uh, with Secretary Carter that making it easier to go in and out uh, would improve matters considerably. Um, but we also have to recognize right now that one of the frustrations, uh, people who are interested in joining the government almost universally experience is the six to nine months it takes to even get an answer as to whether they're going to be hired. So I think we have a lot of basic building to do going forward. And we need, at, in, in particular, to figure out what is our technology strategy? How broad is it going to be? If it's just limited to the Defense Department or even just led by the Defense Department, 
we will not economically compete well with China. All right, thank you for kicking us off. Uh, so uh, while the federal government re remains the largest research and development investor, uh, private sector investments are much greater and typically focused more on usable applications. And it's the private sector that also manufactures, delivers and supports the use of science and technology capabilities. And standards are always based on community-wide consensus. Uh, so Dave, following up on what Tara just told us uh, and coming from your private sector perspective, how can we drive national level collaboration on priority s and issues so that non-government entities are enticed to participate and that we don't negatively impact innovation and competition? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the story that influences me here is having started at IBM Research in 1988, and, and even though I've only spent about half of my career in the research division proper, I've always been you know, closely connected to it. And, we're not a universal, universally applicable story, but IBM's a big enough company and our research division is broad enough that the way it has evolved, I think serves as a bit of an example for what I think has been happening in innovation and, and, and the application of research. So when I came in 1988, I can remember that we were frustrated with two things. One was the speed of moving an idea from a researcher's head into the hands of our client, because it would have to go through a research process, a development process, a productization process, a market analysis process. And it, it always seemed to us as researchers uh, that it was taking too long. Um, and, and we also had an issue with yield of ideas that seemed genuinely very powerful, but didn't fit correctly with a business strategy or a marketing strategy or a development strategy, which either suggests that the back end is broken or the front end is working on the wrong things. And so we had an incredibly, and have today, an incredibly powerful research enterprise. And we were worried about speed of innovation and yield of, of the projects we worked on actually being in the hands of our clients and, and driving you know, their progress. Now, of course, in the research enterprise, it's not reasonable to expect a yield of 100%. You could argue, in fact, that you're not doing research if, if that's your yield. So you certainly didn't, weren't, weren't shooting for 100%. But if I look at how we've evolved our research strategy, and, and I think it is, it is a durable example applicable elsewhere, what we've done to address both of those problems is we've moved the researchers into much more of the context of our end users. And I don't mean just our own IBM development labs, I mean the actual clients. And so we don't expect the researchers to be experts in our clients' business, but we do expect them to be very knowledgeable about it and to understand how the technology fits into our clients' business, what our clients' future needs are going to be so that the research that they do, even the fundamental scientific research they do is not dictated by, but I would say informed by a knowledge of where it's going to land or what it's going to do. And once you start making the researchers, as, as one of our former directors of research, Jim McGrady used to say, as you make the researchers more worldly, they'll have a much, much better idea of how to steer the work and, and how to do the work so that the chances of it mattering go up a lot and the speed of, of, of that innovation to the client's hands goes up. So for example, you know, researchers working in semiconductor technology need to be very well versed in materials properties and, 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 and other aspects that may not be relevant in a purely research environment, but may be incredibly relevant in a, in a production environment in terms of uh, the manufacturability and availability of, of exotic materials being one, one simple example. And so watching all of that happen and having a lot of conversations with our clients on this topic, um, I like to think about the, the, the subject of innovation, which I think this, this discussion is a part of, as having three dimensions. So think of it as a, you know, our, our quantum team likes to talk about quantum volume, you know, uh, three, three kind of orthogonal figures of merit that, that would, um, that would tell you how good a quantum computer is. Let's talk about three orthogonal dimensions that could create an innovation volume. And so I think when you talk about innovation, speed is always the most frequent thing that comes to mind. How quickly can I take an idea into the hands of an end user? And it's manifested itself in very, very many interesting ways in the military and, and in the commercial world. 
So that's always going to be bedrock. And then the second one, which I think is you know equally important, maybe less talked about, but but in my opinion, perhaps even more important, is depth. How hard a problem can you solve? How deep is your scientific expertise? How much of an understanding do you have of, of a phenomenon, you know, literally down to the the, the, the atoms and, and and the quantum mechanical interactions underneath? And interestingly, you know, startup companies and the whole startup culture is optimized to take advantage of dimension number one of speed. They, everything about them is is built for speed. Larger organizations, large commercial enterprises, large academic institutions, uh, you know, large parts of government are at a scale where they can achieve a considerable and impressive technical depth. And so. Speed tends to t generally favor a smaller organization. Depth tends to generally favor a larger organization. But the key that I learned from watching our research evolve, which has been, I think, well applied to other places, is the third dimension, which I would call context. Um, and so a lot of this talk about the in-between organizations connecting, I think, is getting at this same idea, which is, do you understand the environment into which you are speeding these innovations and into which you are applying this depth? And do you actually have an understanding of the complete end-to-end -end process you know, from the mind of the researcher to the hands of the end user, whether they're a soldier or a sailor or, or a commercial client? And, and that context dimension is the least talked about. Uh, and in the end, I think it determines whether the speed you can achieve and the depth that you can manage actually matter. And so if I were to summarize the transformation of our division over the 30 years I've been involved with it personally, it's been to enhance that context, to make sure that the researchers are in the client context, to make sure the clients you know, visit the researchers, come to the lab, see what's possible, and that the two ends of the spectrum do their best to co-create how they join in the middle and how they do things that, that ride all the way through this continuum. And as, and as I read you know, the MITRE paper outlining the thoughts for what we need to do for these upcoming um, you know, federal investments that this administration, I think, is wisely pushing. Uh, to me, I would put all of that into the category of, you know, yes, we, we could always do better to enhance the speed and enhance the depth. But I think the, 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 the MITRE paper to me spoke very much to this idea of developing a joint context and making sure that it isn't just an academic exercise. Obviously, that's foundational. Um, and, and with the possible exception that lots of academics today are trying to be in business themselves as principles of startup companies, it doesn't solve the problem of bridging to you know, very large scale and very broad manufacturing. So if we are in fact to make the biggest effect out of these investments, we do need, need to manage this context from end to end. And it implies to me some, some interesting and I think very creative work that that our government has increasingly been willing to do. In fact, I applaud DOD on this. Uh, they've been much more willing to use the knobs that were already built into their procurement system to do different things. And so instead of just bidding on someone to do work by the hour um, and lock up you know, the implementation of a technology uh, privately, they've been much smarter about telling companies which things you know, have to be placed into standards, which things have to be placed into open technologies, which things are proprietary, which things the, the companies will have rights to and will not. And I think some, some, there's some people in DOD now that are very, very creative in how to operate the mechanics of a procurement system that works in this very different world. And, and, and if I were to sum up what's different about it, remember in the kinetic domain, for a lot of history, nobody else made supersonic fighters. Nobody else made nuclear weapons. Nobody else made any of these things. So the Department of Defense had to carry the entire burden for not just the procurement, but the technology development of some of the most complicated things humans have ever built. That's well, thanks, still largely thanks, Dave. true. Uh, so uh, yeah. I, I'm going to have to break in here so we can get to some of the other thoughts. Uh -huh. uh, I would love to listen to you for an hour or so. Right, right. <laughs> it's it's, it's I get very enticing. Uh, so uh, appreciate it. So uh, let, let's shift gears just slightly. Uh, so in the U.S., many of our most prosperous and influential researchers and technology companies are concentrated in a handful of locations. Uh, President Biden has mentioned uh, that for us to succeed, we really need to involve everyone. Uh, Rob, you have spent years analyzing national and regional innovation around the world. Uh, what insights can you provide on how both targeted innovation hubs 
and distributed expertise can benefit national objectives? And what do we need to do to maximize the value of both? Yeah, sure. I mean, so one of the things I think that's become clear to most people who study innovation, national innovation systems, is that there's really two processes, there's two systems really. One is, is kind of sector-based or technology-based. So, uh, you know, firms in aerospace <clears throat> maybe talk to each other all across the country, but the other is regional. And there's a real recognition that regional clustering, uh, local economies, agglomeration economies, and what, what economists call it, are really more important. I remember back when I was at OTA and we were, you know, I think pretty instrumental in getting the technology reinvestment program um, funded by Congress. And I remember going over to DOD uh, for a meeting about that, because in that program, it talked about re supporting regional innovation. I won't say who it was, many people will know this person, but this leading DOD official said to me, said, now there's no, regional innovation doesn't matter. When, when Boeing wants to talk to somebody, they just pick up the phone and call across the country. Uh, I don't think anybody now would say that. It's pretty clear that regional clusters of innovation matter significantly. The problem is that over the last uh, 10 years or so, almost all, in fact, all the jobs growth in technology have been to five major technology hubs, as, as we showed in a report in late 2019, calling for a big federal initiative on this. Uh, Boston, Silicon Valley, Seattle, LA, I think, um, maybe one other. So. Okay, so why is it better to have some focus on, on the, why not just let it all keep going to Boston and Silicon Valley? There's really two big reasons, I think. One is if you've ever been to Silicon Valley recently, uh, super hard to afford a house. Uh, my son got a job out there as a computer scientist and his mortgage for his little teeny studio apartment is, is not his mortgage, his rent was bigger than my mortgage in Bethesda, Maryland. So you know, those places are, there's just too much there. And, and so what those companies do now increasingly is they'll have some core functions there, but they'll move a lot of other things away. And you say, well, that's good. They'll move them to the heartland of the US, maybe St. Louis or Pittsburgh or Birmingham. No, what they do is they move it to other technology hubs around the world. So they'll go to Shanghai, they'll go to Tel Aviv, they'll go to Taipei, um, they'll go to Vancouver. Uh, they ought to be going to the U.S. And the reason they don't go to the U.S., other places in the U.S., is a chicken or egg issue. Why be the first or second one in Indianapolis? Are you, are you going to be the only one there? Will you be able to attract other workers, tech workers there? Will other tech firms join you? So we would be a lot better off if we could sort of solve that market failure of coordination and signaling if we could designate a few tech hubs around the country to really grow and as part of that really allow and enable their re leading research universities to sort of get up to that next level you look at a lot of these places as we did in our report uh, places like boston silicon valley they're sort of 1.2 to 1.4 billion a year in federal support for research universities you go down the next level they're sort of 800, 700, bill, 700 million a year. So not all that far off. So anyway, so the, the Endless Frontier Act, and I believe in the latest iteration from the Senate Commerce Markup, includes this, this program to create a, kind of a national competition for these advanced technology hubs. Uh, I think that would make the country much more, much stronger uh, for innovation. It would make us more competitive. And one last point I'll make, which is a political economy point, I don't think it's any surprise that we've been cutting R&D as a share of GDP for the last, you know, how many years, 30 years, 20 years, because I think a lot of the members of Congress who aren't in these places, they don't see the value of it. They don't, they don't experience it the way that, say, that, you know, Elizabeth Warren does from Massachusetts. Elizabeth Warren's pretty, pretty liberal member of Congress, but she's very committed to federal R&D. So if we can get more tech hubs through the country, I think we just build the political economy, both among US uh, citizens, but also among political uh, uh, elected officials to support much more robust federal support for innovation. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, the, uh, the entirety of America's science and technology community must be leveraged in a new national approach to S&T, but we currently have a lot of stovepipes and restrictions that may need to be reimagined going forward. Uh, Teresa, as you said, your career has been uh, spending in academia, which is a valuable perspective itself. But uh, you also mentioned that you are a member of PCAST, which recently studied multi-sector collaboration uh, within a concept they called Industries of the Future Institutes. Uh, 
Could you tie some of the discussion we've been having together here and, uh, and discuss how Biden's tasker to his incoming science advisor and some of the legislative proposals that we just talked about uh, uh, are generating so much interest can contribute to overcoming the needs that we've discussed? Yeah, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, that, that's a great question. And I think uh, being last on the panel, I do get the opportunity to just pull everything together. And I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Carter's points. And I, I just want to highlight and reiterate a few of those points. I think we, we all fully agree that the nation has really prospered because of our longstanding global leadership in science and technology. Um, it's not only fueled our economy, it's improved the quality of life here in the U.S. and around the world, um, and it's uh, strengthened and secured our national security. Um, the items in terms of thinking about it from a leadership perspective, I think have been elevated already, but it's really the U.S., the pioneering, the creative and innovative spirit, but really importantly, that that is, has been aligned with sustained and strategic investments in R&D. Um, you know, going back uh, to uh, the uh, Sputnik time when investments were made uh, in the federal agencies um, to really uh, you know, underscore the work in universities, um, not only from the perspective of conducting research, but to ensure that integrated talent pipeline um, into our very vibrant private sector labs. And let's not forget the, the importance, and I'd say the growing importance of our philanthropic sector to, to that success. Um, Dr. Carter talked a lot about our leadership being challenged um, by rising international competition, um, but really critically, uh, it's uh, the competition in key scientific and technology areas. Um, and we are hearing those areas called industries of the future. So those include artificial intelligence, quantum information science, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, communications networks, and importantly, microelectronics and semiconductors that really form the foundation for so many of those technologies. Um, we're, we're really being you know, uh, under, under fierce competition in those areas. Um, so success as we move forward uh, is really looking across the, uh, the, the spectrum from basic research um, to being able to translate into practice. And increasingly in those industries of the future, um, that will require a strong focus on convergence across multiple disciplines um, and that cross-sector collaboration investment. And so uh, again, reaching back to, to Dr. Carter, calling that the secret sauce of the US. Um, this is really thinking about the secret sauce on steroids, so to speak, when we're really thinking about um, the multi-sector uh, convergence. Um, in addition, uh, addressing the, the growing talent gap by harnessing the full potential of our country, um, as well as uh, really continuing to serve as a magnet to attract the best and the brightest uh, to our country. Um, one thing that hasn't come up, uh, but during our work with PCAST, it was really a driving factor as we're thinking about uh, taking that next step in multi-sector partnerships. Um, we can't forget um, the increasing administrative and regulatory barriers um, that are increasingly stifling that intellectual risk-taking, the innovation, and the ability for all of our sectors to come together to develop that robust ecosystem. Um, and to be able to interact seamlessly and um, productively for mutual benefit. Um, so the uh, PCAS took a look at all of those. We did a deep dive looking at those administrative and regulatory barriers and outlined a new paradigm for collaboration. We called it Industries of the Future Institutes. And it's been interesting to see this really um, come, I think, come to fruition in some of the proposals in the Endless Frontiers Act. Um, going back to uh, many of the comments that Rob made. Um, it's really about forming an agile organization, uh, organizational framework um, aimed at addressing challenges to US science and technology. Um, developing that framework in a way that realizes the full potential of the multi-sector partnerships across government, universities, private industry, um, nonprofits and foundations um, to drive use inspired research and translation, but not forgetting that the country needs to continue to invest 
in blue sky research, you know, going back to the days of Bell Labs, um, you know, IBM research and many others, uh, PARC and many others. Um, but uh, critical to all of this is talent. Um, our, our, our number one priority really needs to be talent. So expanding the future STEM workforce to grow the nice nation's science and technology enterprise. Um, looking both at PCAST as well as the recommendations coming out, out of the National Science Board in the fall, STEM talent uh, rose to the top as the number one priority. And I don't know if many are aware of some of the sh really shocking numbers. In 2016, the World Economic Forum reported that China had over 4.7 million new STEM graduates, India 2.6 million, and the US about 600,000. And the gap is continuing to grow. And so this is something really important for us to double down on. So I think as everybody has said already, um, we certainly uh, are applauding our nation's leaders now for recognizing both the value and the critical importance of increased investment and fundamental to use inspired research. Um, the Endless Frontiers Act um, that also recognizes the importance of technology hubs that are distributed across the country so we can tap into the talent base um, across the entire country uh, is, is certainly something uh, that we're very much welcoming. Um, in terms of Biden's taskers, just really quickly, I think it's uh, you know, interesting to just highlight a couple of the questions. What can we learn from the pandemic? And one of the most important things that we've learned really goes back to those regulatory barriers. Um, we have learned that we can reduce those barriers very quickly when we have the will to do so. And hopefully that's something that we can continue to reflect on um, more generally. Uh, ensuring uh, the, that the world leadership and technologies and, and, uh, and industries of the future. Um, again, uh, we, we uh, have discussed that, um, as well as in ensuring the long-term health of the s and in our nation. Uh, it is really critically important that we continue to uh, diversify our talent base. Um, we provide opportunities. And as we think specifically about the government, um, again, I was struck by uh, Dr. Carter's, you know, um, uh, discussion about the fact that I think it's very important for us to elevate the mission. Um, if on academic campuses today, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to get the word out. Um, the importance of having our students consider uh, public service uh, as we think about the key technology problems uh, that we really need to address. So I think that spirit is coming back and um, it's, it's really up to our community uh, to continue to reinforce that. So um, I just want to, uh, with that, Duane, um, uh, ask a, a quick question um, of you uh, as we move okay. into the Q&A. So uh, leveraging your time and experience at OSTP, what needs to be done at the level, at that level, to ensure the federal government is in a better uh, is a better partner on tackling S and T from a national perspective. All right, that's a I appreciate the question. That it's it's a hard one. Uh, so within OSTP, they lead something called the National Science and Technology Council, uh, which has been very influential over the the past several administrations on coordinating uh, interagency research strategies and plans. Uh, I think we can expand that so that we can kind of break down that, that government and non-government entity barrier a little bit and involve non-government entities in creating the federal government's research strategies. Uh, but also think there are opportunities to uh, expand the focus of the NSTC. Uh, it is the NSTC, Science and Technology Council, not just the Research and Development Council. So a lot of these non-research science and technology aspects that we've been talking about today, in my mind, uh, that's an opportunity for uh, the, the NSTC to expand. It has been done in the past. Uh, I led a couple of uh, subcommittees that did that, uh, tackled all kinds of issues such as communications, privacy, interoperability of systems and those types of things. So I think that could be a good avenue for better federal government coordination. Uh, and, and that can kind of serve as a way to uh, entice uh, private sector collaboration as well. Uh, so thank you with that. All right, we are, uh, we have tons and tons of questions. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to get through hardly any of them, uh, but I'm, what I'm gonna do is ask 
one question and give each of you 30 seconds uh, to respond uh, because I think it's a really good one. Uh, and there, it's, there are no right or wrong answers. So we're, we're gonna be asking for your opinion. Uh, so President Biden's budget hasn't been submitted and no one knows how much will actually end up being appropriated. But of all the S&T technology properties, uh, priorities that we've been talking about during the session, which would you prioritize even if there didn't turn out to be any, uh, a lot of extra money that became available. Uh, so Tara, let's put you on the spot first. Um, so of course I'm torn between two, but I will start with um, bring more technical talent into the government, all branches, all level, using all means at our disposal and make it easier to go in and out of the government. All right, thank you. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I, I agree, Tara, that's, that, that's at the root of, of everything. Uh, the other area I'd be tempted to take a, another bite at is artificial intelligence. And I know that's too big a thing to consider one thing, but we've gone about, we've gone a considerable distance in AI using statistical techniques. And the next step is gonna be to bring more um, the exploitation of knowledge into it. So I think there's another chance to have a bite at the apple and another another way to lead in AI if we get serious about it. And that, that bridges across many domains. All right, thanks. Rob. Uh, plastics. <laughs> You're gonna have to explain that a little more for me, Rob. <laughs> the graduate, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, <laughs> movie illusion, sorry. Um, well, you know, couple, one, two things. One, we did an analysis of the president's skinny budget, if you will. And, and I got to say, I, I wasn't, it, it was not at all as optimistic as I thought. Uh, S&T and competitiveness kinds of things got, you know, very little increase really compared to things on energy or social welfare or just kind of social spending. Um, so I hope that the full budget changes that. But what I would prioritize would be a large amount of investment in industry, university, government, technology partnerships. So for example, what we did with uh, the Focus Center, well, I guess now it's called Star, Star, I can't remember the name of it, Star something, uh, which is the semiconductor industry getting together with our leading universities. I think we should do that in a lot of different industries. And maybe uh, with that sort of aligns maybe with Teresa's idea of, of these, uh, industries of the future center we need to put glue money at minimum behind that so that when industry comes together they're actually getting support all right thanks and uh batting cleanup again our pcat our pcast uh, rep teresa hope oh, you're muted too um i just really have to underscore tara's point uh, investments in uh, really starting to close the gap. And I think it's critically important that we uh, continue to um, elevate the importance of not leaving anyone behind. Uh, if we look at the STEM fields, of course, there is a very large um, gender gap, um, as well as the need to continue to uh, develop pipelines and develop uh, uh, approaches where, where we can um, much more effectively engage underrepresented and first-gen students. Um, and then uh, on the technology side, I, I think that it's just critically important for our country to double down um, our investments in, in microelectronics. Uh, Starnet was an excellent example. I was actually part of that program in, in my own research career. Uh, I thought it, uh, you know, um, we are in a position where all of the critical technologies, if we think of the industries of the future, um, they're built on that base. And when we look at the supply chain limitations uh, in the US and, and frankly across the world, you can see the impact that that's having. So continuing to um, reshore some of that uh, effort, some of that activity is going to be really critically important to our economic prosperity and national security. All right. Thank you, Teresa. And uh, thanks again for all of you for a great uh, panel discussion. I learned a lot, uh, lots of different things for me to further investigate as well. And uh, we didn't get through uh, that many uh, questions here, Charles, but uh, that, that kind of shows that there's a lot of interest. Uh, so I think uh, our plans to kind of continue this series uh, is a good one. So that I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dwayne. And, and thank you to all of the panelists uh, for your, your excellent commentary uh, this afternoon. 
Um, I do want to do a little bit of promo on a, uh, a paper that MITRE published today. Uh, it's a horizon strategy framework for science and technology policy. Uh, and you can get it uh, there at the URL, uh, mitre.org slash mitre lab slash horizons. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, labs at mitre.org or policy at mitre.org for, for more information. Uh, this paper is really our attempt to uh, really get the conversation started around um, how might we even think about such a large scale investment uh, in, in science and technology and, and thanks to, to Chris Ford, who is the primary author of, of this paper. Um, so with that, we are concluded. Uh, thank you again and uh, join us next month for, uh, for, for the next episode in uh, our Grand Challenges Power Hour. And of course, uh, back to our workforce topic, um, MITRE is, is always hiring. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to recruitinghelp at MITRE.org and happy to connect you with, with opportunities here at MITRE. Uh, thanks all and have a great evening. <laughs>